After uh, three engineers and uh, ten minutes, we're uh, ready to do a presentation. <laughs> Technology is wonderful. Uh, so, uh, as uh, the slide implies, my name is Douglas Fuller, uh, and uh, I'm a member of the National Climate Computing Research Center, and I'll explain why my slides uh, look like ORNL and also say uh, National Climate Computing Research Center in a moment. Uh, so I'm glad I have a few extra minutes. I also uh, have the uh, honor of having the most conveniently scheduled talk because if you look on the agenda, uh, you've got uh, Frank and Naviglio from NOAA coming up to assassinate me right afterwards. Uh, so fortunately, there's a break so that I can escape. Uh, yes, that, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, my, my thanks to the committee. Uh, so, uh, as I promised, I'll explain a little bit about what the National Climate Computing Research Center is to save Frank a slide or two. Uh, and essentially, uh, NCRC is a, a partnership between us at Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, and NOAA. Uh, and the, uh, the primary uh, users at NOAA for the, uh, for the center we set up uh, are at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton. Uh, but the compute facility is in Oak Ridge, and so you'll see that uh, at least our uh, geographic disparity uh, motivates uh, quite a few of the issues that I'll discuss. Uh, so uh, we uh, first began operations in September 2010, obviously uh, after a, a planning and deployment phase. Uh, and we'll still have upgrades uh, coming in through next year. Uh, we're scheduled to continue until 2014. Uh, and so although so far it's been a very productive partnership, we, uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, and so we look forward to continuing that. Uh, so uh, straight away, the, the um, main compute platform that we use at the National Climate Computing Research Center is called Gaia. Uh, so you can see our, uh, our uh, picture here depicting the uh, phase one system as far as the graphic there stretches. Uh, and then uh, the phase two system, which is sort of uh, fading into the picture there. Uh, the first drop is uh, a Cray XT6 for those that aren't familiar with the finer points of uh, Cray model numbering. Uh, that implies that uh, you're looking at a two socket compute blade with, the, uh, with Cray's C star interconnect. Uh, so there's about 2,500 processors, about a quarter petaflop peak performance. Uh, and uh, of course, although this is an HPC talk and does lack a slide from the top 500 list, uh, at the very least, uh, I can say it's very impressive that this footprint fits in 14 cabinets. Uh, and uh, it's, it's impressive to see the levels of performance and the, and the evolution uh, looking right on the floor of the computing facility at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, it runs with 80 terabytes main memory. We over provision the main memory because we're going to chip it up uh, next year with, uh, with 16 core processors. It's got the uh, 12 core now. Uh, so we'll upgrade that. Uh, you know, our, I have in 2011, here we may go 2012. Uh, the phase two machine is due to drop in late 2011 this year uh, with the 16 core, the new AMD processor, and uh, we're looking at a, uh, a total of 42 cabinet drop. Uh, the, uh, the second phase is uh, due to peak around three quarters of a petaflop, so we should be just over a, a full petaflop in peak performance uh, when that finally drops. Uh, and uh, we're looking at about 160 terabytes of memory for that machine. Uh, then afterwards, we'll go back and upgrade the, uh, the phase one drop to match the, uh, the phase two system. Uh, again, for those people not familiar with, uh, uh, with Cray model numbering, the XE6 system there indicates uh, Cray's next generation interconnect, which we've been experimenting with, uh, with uh, with some of our workload at uh, ORNL and some of the workload that uh, we anticipate with NCRC and early indicators uh, suggest that uh, we'll see a significant improvement in performance. All right, so uh, this is a file system conference after all, so I suppose I should discuss the file system we deployed. Uh, and uh, in motivating our, uh, our deployment strategy, uh, I'll refer to the obvious capability, capacity, and cost considered when any file system deployment is made. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, we're looking for uh, performance in any type of HPC workload. Uh, but one of the most important aspects of performance for this deployment uh, was we wanted a we wanted consistent performance, not just a high peak number, but rather uh, a consistent performance across uh, a large workload that will be that's running relatively constantly. Uh, so. You know, that's a challenge for a production-oriented workload on, uh, uh, on an HPC system, especially when you consider the, the storage component. Uh, storage solutions facing uh, random I.O. are uh, essentially dealing with a pessimal use case. Uh, and so our, uh, it, it's a challenge to consider how to uh, maintain consistent performance throughout uh, uh, a uh, large and varying workload. 
Uh, also, there's a lot of other work to do besides just compute on this platform. Uh, the uh, uh, the use cases are very uh, are very workflow oriented, uh, and I'm sure Frank will give you an overview of that uh, in his talk following mine. Uh, so I won't dwell on it here. But essentially, there are uh, uh, there's a lot of extra I/O work to be done besides just running compute jobs. Uh, so simply output dump from compute is not all this file system is required to do. Uh, and so when we were considering this deployment, we had to think about all of the other use cases and how they would affect the production I.O. workload. Uh, and so you'll see sort of elements of that strategy as I discuss uh, how we did the deployment. Uh, finally, of course, you want some resiliency in your file system. And I don't think I need to uh, labor, uh, belabor that point here in, uh, uh, at LUG, but uh, I'll talk uh, at least a little bit about the uh, uh, the issues we faced when we were uh, considering reliability. Uh, so uh, looking at the uh, at our targets for deployment, uh, we did some uh, projections from previous systems that both we have used at ORNL and that NOAA has used before uh, to figure out what kind of capability, performance capability, I mean, that uh, we were looking for in our file system deployment. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, we looked at how much data that the, uh, this, the uh, NOAA's existing systems produced per day, uh, and we looked at the uh, I.O. duty cycles used on their codes, and we tried to, uh, from there, project uh, what a system of this performance would, uh, would be able to put out uh, in terms of I.O. Uh, we also had to consider that we were deploying two primary compute partitions, right? Uh, and so as a result, we had to size the I.O. subsystem for uh, not just one, but two systems simultaneously. Uh, and in addition, we had to make sure that our interconnect network uh, facilitated the use of both systems. Uh, and again, a bunch of auxiliary work, which I'll get into uh, a little bit later. Uh, and then I'm sure Frank will give you more details uh, following that. Uh, so uh, also, of course, we, we are talking about a file system and storing data. Uh, so it was important to think about the use cases, uh, the capacity use cases that also need performance, whether those use cases need high performance, uh, whether they need consistent performance, or whether they're simply uh, bulk data storage. Obviously, Scratch is what you think of when you first think of Lustre, and I know many of us are working to change that. Uh, but also, as I'll explain in a moment, uh, since we're geographically far from our, uh, most of our users, uh, we also want to function as so we want the file system to function as sort of a hot data set cache. Uh, in other words, we want to store uh, near the system as much of the uh, as much of the data sets that we uh, that we can, uh, so that they don't all have to be transferred from far away. Uh, finally, we also want our uh, the file system to function as sort of a semi-persistent library, a uh, an area where uh, many working data sets can be stored instead of just. Uh, uh, instead of just uh, you know, model output. Uh, and finally, we need to, uh, the file system to function as a buffer uh, for WAN transfer works, again, since we're geographically far from our users, uh, and they're constantly shuffling data back and forth. It's important to be able to cache as much of that as we can, uh, so that, because uh, obviously the system can compute uh, considerably faster than any of the data transfers. So in order to keep the system busy, we want to function, uh, we want to have uh, a sort of caching capability uh, to go along with the production I.O. workload. Uh, now we also have a, a significant consistency requirement that's uh, you know, a bit different from previous deployments that we've done. But the problem is we have all of these different use cases that I alluded to earlier. So we have some use cases that really demand performance, that demand uh, consistent high performance I.O. capability. Uh, obviously, Scratch is, a, is uh, almost entirely a performance play. Uh, and the hot data set cache is sort of, you know, read Scratch, right? So that's, it's also important to make sure that, uh, that uh, we get good performance with those, uh, uh, with those factors. Uh, but really, now, a couple of the other things we do are more capacity plays as opposed to capability ones. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mentioned that we want to serve as, a, uh, as sort of a data cache. Uh, and while, of course, performance is important, it's not uh, really comparable to the compute performance on the, uh, on the systems. Uh, it's really more that the, uh, the cache needs to be able to outrun the, uh, the WAN transfer links, uh, and that's not terribly hard. Uh, but essentially, we do want as much storage uh, capacity as we can get uh, for that type of uh, uh, for that type of work, uh, and so of course, then again, 
uh, that leads us to consider cost because it's wonderful to have lots of capability and lots of capacity. Uh, but then again, you have to be able to afford it. Uh, on a side note here, uh, I, you know, I, I think we, could, we probably all share the pain in this room uh, about specking I.O. deployments to go along with compute uh, because we're, we're the ones always getting squeezed on cost, right? And we're the ones the users always complain about when the system goes into production. Uh, but of course, uh, there's no top 500 list for file systems, and as a result, uh, I think we're often overlooked in terms of budget. Uh, and so that, pre that presents some significant challenges, right? Uh, it turns out that I.O. seems to be the thing that's always getting cut in the end. Uh, and while I'm in the sense preaching to the choir here, uh, I like to complain as much as I can and as loudly as I can at HBC conferences uh, about, how, uh, about how little attention uh, is uh, paid to the file system component uh, during the deployment, followed by how much is paid by the users following uh, operations. Uh, so uh, once again, I'm, uh, I'm preaching to the choir here, so I need not continue about that. Uh, but of course, cost was an important motivating factor for us, and we were trying to squeeze the cost down to make sure we could provide sufficient compute capability. Uh, and so, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, we're seen as the robber, uh, as I/O people going in and saying, "Hey, you're specking us a petaflop of compute, uh, and not enough I/O. We need more budget." Uh, and of course, that goes over as a funny joke uh, in uh, all procurement discussions. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, as a result, though, considering all these use cases and on a limited budget, it was important for us to figure out how we were going to make all this stuff happen. Uh, and I should mention also that uh, it's sort of a double whammy when we ask for more budget and provisioning in I.O. Because not only do we ask for uh, you know, more disks, more disk controllers, more, uh, more uh, I.O. nodes, uh, we also ask for more I.O. capability to be attached to the compute platform. And so we also take compute uh, capability away from the compute platform uh, to dedicate to serving storage. So we sort of uh, have a double impact on, uh, on compute when we want to do more I.O. So essentially what we decided to do was to split our uh, file system into two because essentially we had some, uh, some pretty strict uh, capability requirements uh, but also some use cases that really required more uh, capacity. Uh, so uh, this slide here details the, uh, the actual uh, split deployment that we did. Uh, we implemented the DDN uh, SFA 10,000. Uh, and uh, you'll see here, if you look at the, uh, uh, at the uh, we named the file systems Fast Scratch and Long Term Fast Scratch because creativity was an important part of the deployment. Uh, but if you look on the, on the left at the Fast Scratch, it's much, it's much more obviously a capability play, right? A performance file system uh, deployed with far more OSS nodes and uh, so uh, far sparser storage really designed to uh, maximize the, uh, uh, the performance of the, uh, of the SFA 10,000 as opposed to uh, a capacity play. Uh, so we depopulated the uh, the uh, drive trays on the system to fit the, uh, uh, the performance envelope. And you'll see with the long-term fast scratch, we included much larger, slower disks uh, and uh, far more disks per uh, OSS node. So uh, we, were we were trying to decouple sort of our capability use cases and our capacity ones. Uh, and uh, so obviously this creates, uh, this is nicer from a budget perspective because uh, we can target our file systems for exactly for the use cases. Uh, but we've got two compute platforms and now two file systems. So that greatly increases the complexity of our deployment. Uh, so here's just a quick cartoon describing how everything is connected together. Uh, and uh, you'll get more details from this, uh, on this from Frank, I am certain. Uh, so you'll see uh, the two compute partitions here, of course, the, uh, the, the future one, uh, the future compute partition uh, fading in there. We only connected the, uh, the capability uh, file system to the compute platforms. So the capacity file system, the LTFS, is uh, uh, not directly accessible. Uh, you'll see there's some uh, data transfer pieces in the middle that I'll explain in a moment here. Uh, but uh, you can see that this increases our complexity greatly, right? Uh, and we depend a lot on, uh, on sort of Moab to conduct this dance and make everything work well together. Uh, and again, I'm sure Frank will, uh, will talk about how well that's working. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, as I mentioned here, the compute platform really only sees the, ca the, uh, the capability file system. Uh, and the capacity file system is used more for staging and data transfer. Uh, and really, you hope that the data staging that comes from the capacity file system into the capability one is relatively sequential, right? Uh, of course, the hope for sequential I.O. is, uh, you know, something we all wish for and we never get. We spec our file systems based on sequential I.O. and then no user ever does it. But the, uh, uh, the hope here is that at least data staging will be relatively sequential and we should be able to avoid uh, significant performance overheads on the capability file system uh, by making sure that those data transfers are as well behaved as possible. Uh, and so that uh, we 
Uh, we do that data, and then when we stage data back, we stage it back to this bulk storage again, uh, hopefully in a sequential fashion after uh, the uh, compute partition has done its output. Uh, and this data staging step, uh, you know, like I said, increases complexity, but hopefully improves the sequentiality of the I.O. to that file system, as opposed to doing a lot of random uh, I.O. on uh, what's essentially a, a uh, capacity file system. Uh, and uh, since we deployed two file systems, we tried to uh, leverage synergies. I have to use synergy in a, in a workshop talk to, uh, uh, to imply that I, uh, I did something useful. Uh, yeah, I got a woohoo, thank you. Uh, uh, but uh, we tried to use synergies in the hardware where we could. So, for example, uh, you know, we deployed uh, InfiniBand networks for these file systems, uh, and so we cross-connected the switches uh, for uh, redundancy purposes. Uh, so, uh, you know, that helps a little, and it makes sure that, uh, you know, wherever we can, uh, we use these uh, resources uh, effectively. Uh, also, uh, I mentioned that we have these uh, these data staging nodes here. I'll, d I'll talk about the details in a second. But we also try and get them to do some do double duty. So we have them do some very lightweight post-processing where they're doing uh, sequential reads from uh, one file system and sequential writes to another. Uh, and again, that just sort of lets us offload a little bit of the compute, but more importantly, the sequential I.O. Uh, from uh, the compute platforms. Uh, so wherever we can, we're trying to uh, uh, you know, although this is a complicated setup, we're trying to simplify things by uh, using uh, by using resources uh, in multiple ways. Uh, so I said I'd explain the data movers. So here's the payoff. The uh, uh, so we have a couple of different types of data movers uh, because essentially we have since we have two file systems, one of which is not directly connected to the primary compute platforms, we need data movers to slosh data back and forth. And so we deployed 16 uh, InfiniBand servers uh, solely to handle data transfer between these two file systems. Uh, and again, as part of the uh, uh, as part of the the synergies that we're trying to to put into place, we're trying to use them for some lightweight post processing. But essentially, they're data sloshers. Uh, and they're running a couple of tools that we developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, uh, including a, uh, a data staging uh, tool that's uh, Lustre aware. So essentially, it's re it reads and writes stripes. Uh, it's downloadable from our website. It's called the Staging Parallel Distributed Copy Tool, SPDCP. Uh, and that was developed at, uh, at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And it, uh, it helps us handle high-speed data transfer between Lustre file systems. Uh, and uh, so like I said, the, the LDTNs also handle some of the, uh, the local post-processing. Finally, we need uh, data movers to slosh data back and forth between uh, essentially Princeton and Oak Ridge. Uh, and uh, these data movers, as you can see in the diagram, operate uh, you know, uh, between the WAN and the, uh, the uh, capacity file system. Uh, and uh, we have eight of these in there. Uh, they're connected both with uh, Ethernet for the WAN and InfiniBand for the local uh, file system networks. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and you can see here that if we have to slosh data in from afar, from the WAN, then slosh it between our capability and capacity file systems. We're doing a lot of extra work here. Uh, and although that, that improves the sequentiality of our I.O., uh, it results in a lot more complicated workflow. Uh, and uh, so as I mentioned in the opening, uh, we rely on our scheduler to, uh, to do a lot of extra work here. Uh, and uh, that uh, produces some challenges as a result. Again, I'm sure Frank will get into those. Uh, so that's, uh, that wraps up the, uh, the deployment. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, of course, uh, if there are any, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll run away at the break so that uh, I'm not here for, uh, for Frank's talk. So ask me soon if, uh, if there's anything you need. Thank you. Well, you go, man. Uh, so the, uh, I think this is being recorded, so I'll repeat the questions into the microphone. Uh, I was asked whether we considered uh, doing some of the Lester WAN stuff and actually exporting the file systems directly uh, to uh, uh, directly up to NOAA. Uh, and uh, we looked at we looked at it in advance, and uh, you know we were specking this deployment, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and we uh, we weren't sure about the risk in that solution, uh, but it's something we would definitely look at now. I think if we were doing a, de a fresh deployment. Uh, we're also deploying this file system across organizations. Uh, and so there's an organizational boundary that, uh, you know, occurs in addition to the physical boundary uh, between the, uh, the users, since they're Department of Commerce, and us, since we're Department of Energy. Uh, so there's also a political layer issue. You, you can shout the question and I can repeat it. That's fine, too. 
be fun. Uh, how are you managing authentication across this boundary, or are you? Uh, so the question is, how are we uh, managing uh, authentication across that political layer boundary? Uh, so there's a, there's a couple of different ways we're doing it, and I'm sure uh, Frank will give you some more of the, the details uh, when he gives a presentation. Uh, so uh, we, uh, there's a couple of different ways we do it. Uh, in one, uh, one way we use Globus, so we, uh, we use uh, security certificates. Uh, and uh, we also, uh, do a uh, we also do secure ID key fobs, uh, and our security teams work together to uh, to manage a, an LDAP system that uh, is handled by NOAA for their users, uh, and uh, so they can authenticate either via uh, secure ID uh, or using Globus grid certificates. Yeah, that's right. Uh, by the time I.O. reaches the OSS, the user's logged in or the, a job's running on behalf of the users. Yes, so the, the users don't authenticate themselves to the OSS in any more complicated fashion than, than usual Lustre deployments. Uh, we do the upcall to, uh, we, we pull down things from the, uh, the our data from the, uh, uh, from the directory server for doing, you know, user and group upcall and that stuff. So it's, it's pretty standard. Can you please describe the IB infrastructure? How many switches? What kind of switches? How they're connected to each other? Sure. So the uh, the they uh, oh I don't have to repeat that because it was said into the microphone. So the uh, uh, we deployed uh, Voltaire QDR InfiniBand switches. Uh, we deployed the uh, 104. Oh, I, I can never get the uh, the port numbers right with QDR since it's all uh, multiples of 36. Uh, but essentially, uh, each file system is fully connected uh, on a, a single uh, Voltaire blade switch, uh, and then we cross connected the uh, OSS nodes to. Uh, each other's InfiniBand switches as a backup path. Uh, then the, uh, here, I'll, I'll move back to my diagram slide here. Uh, so if you, uh, these cylinders depict fully connected IB networks, uh, and the, uh, oh, thanks. Uh, laser pointer delivery, see? You talk long enough, of an, and, and eventually they give you laser pointer for free. Uh, so uh, each of these represent fully connected IB networks, uh, and uh, each switch is cross-connected from uh, the compute platforms and the, uh, the data transfer nodes, so that if we lose a switch, we don't lose the file system entirely. Does that fully answer your question, or are you interested in more details? So it sounds like you get the compute, the compute have their own infrastructure IB, and then they sort of the storage the no, uh, So the compute, uh, since the compute is Cray, the, uh, the uh, compute network interconnect is fully integrated, uh, and the in, uh, the entire purpose of the infinite band attached to the compute platforms is I.O. So they're connected directly to the switches uh, to which the OSSs are connected. Um, did you consider using uh, OST pools to make a single file system and just have two different classes of storage? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We did think about that, but again, it was early in the deployment of OST pools. Uh, and uh, so, but it is something we thought, so we, we thought quite a bit about. And again, it's something we might have considered if we were deploying the file system today. Yeah, that's right. Right, that, that's right. Uh, so, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm not sure what the implications are of uh, OST pools and, and failure, but that's right. Uh, so uh, again, this, uh, this goes back to our geographic disparity here a little bit, uh, but we would kind of like to be able to stage more data in even if the production file system is down, uh, right? Because essentially the, the most stringent bottleneck here is the WAN uh, and not really, a, not even the, the local uh, file systems. Anybody else? Uh, I think there's one more behind you. Uh, so, uh, he, oh, go ahead, Hio. What kind of a bandwidth do you achieve with your eight greedy IPTV servers to Princeton? Uh, so, uh, I, I haven't looked at, I, I think uh, we have two 10 gigabit per second links and I think we've been able to peak them before, but that's, uh, uh, I'm not sure what the current status is. I'm mostly concerned with the, uh, with the local stuff. Uh, but uh, I can find out and uh, talk to you about it later if you want. Yeah. If there's no further questions, uh, thanks for your time. Thanks, Doug.